40 years after his historic third victory in the Aintree Grand National, Red Rum is remembered today as we visit the home of Tommy Stack, the man who guided him to that famous success. Tommy has enjoyed huge success in all aspects of his life. Twice a champion jockey, a classic winning trainer, and a group one breeder. We talk to him about his life and career. I suppose we must start with the horse that everybody inside and outside racing associates you with, Red Rum. You rode him to that historic third Grand National victory. You had a long connection with him. Tell me about your connection to Red Rum. When I went to Bobby Renton's, Red Rum had just arrived a, f a year before that. He, he was hurling at the time. And I wasn't... I, he, he got my licence out as an amateur. And I rode for an amateur for two years for Bobby. And uh, Red Rum was still hurling. And he'd won a few hurdle races. Paddy Broderick won on him a few times over hurdles. And the following year, they decided to go chasing with him. So we went down one morning to school him. He told me to go down and school him one morning. He half fell over the first and refused the second. So the old man said, we'll leave him. We'll run him at Newcastle on Wednesday and you can ride him. I says, thanks very much. <laughs> so we go to Newcastle in a two-mile novice chase. We jumped from fence to fence and he finished third. About, we didn't school him in between or nothing again. And we went to Doncaster about three weeks later, over two miles again, and we won. And we beat a good horse of Arthur Stevenson's Celtic Gold, who was a good horse at the time. And he won for a few more races after that that year. So he was on the road and he was, he was jumped well, but very careful, mind himself, looking after. He was lo like a lot of people looking after themselves. But he was an unusual horse. He had been to Aintree for his very first race as a two-year-old. You know, it's amazing, you know, when you think that he won over five at Aintree, dead heated in, in March, as a, uh, March, April, as a two-year-old. And uh, then he won, he ran eight times that year as the two and you won another over seven at Warwick and then he went uh, gone and Leicester rode him as a two-year-old was third on him got beat on him and that wouldn't have been easy with Leicester being on board sure <laughs> and they put him up the next year as well and he got beat uh, yes, again he, he ran twice the following year Tim Maloney trained him did a very good job with him and Leicester was second third second at the this, on, as a three-year-old, he just ran twice. So he ran ten times altogether on the flat. Then Bobby Renton went down and bought him off of Tim Maloney privately. And he came up and he went hurling that year. And the, he jumped hurdles okay. And Josh Gifford was the first to ride him over hurdles at Cheltenham. He was second on him in a, in a September meeting. And then he won, Paddy Broderick got on, he won a few, two or three hurdle races then. But he was a remarkable horse because a lot of jockeys rode him in his career. You rode him more than most. But he was a horse, he, amazingly, he ran a hundred times over jumps. Eight different jockeys rode him on the flat. And then when he came to jumping, 13 different jockeys rode him. And as you said, he ran a hundred times over jumps, which is a, an awful lot of jumping. And he got some hidings. I gave him some hidings as well. And Lester gave him some hidings. So he took, he took abuse as well. And what was it about the horse himself? Had he some special quality that you remember from those days? The horse, he got trouble with his feet when Bobby had him. That's why he sold him. He got trouble with his pibocytis in his feet. Okay. And Ginger bought him. And Ginger came up to me at the sales at Doncaster and said... You can ride him when he runs. I said, fine. So he ran him at Carlisle about three or four months, weeks later. And we won on him at Carlisle. And Ginger was delighted he'd won on him. And, but the salt water at Southport made the big difference to him because he was on it every morning. And he'd, Ginger used to harrow the, 
the uh, salt pot, the sand just about 10 feet off the edge of the water. He'd harrow it and then he'd gallop up and back down it. And that's what, that's what made him the feet. His feet were never any trouble because the horse wanted quite goodish ground. He didn't want it soft. It was soft. He'd run deplorable. He wanted quite good ground, so he wanted everything in his favour. <laughs> but it sounded like that the race course was his training ground, really. Well, it was, yeah, because, you know, he wouldn't kill himself at home, but at Southport he would he'd go down one way and he'd pull hard coming back the other way. But uh, then J uh, I'd won four or five on him for Ginger, and he asked me to ride him in the National. In, this was in on Christmas, that I can't, I'm retained by. Harry Thompson Jones in Newmarket, and I, he said, fine, I'll get somebody. So he asked Brian Fletcher, and he was lucky he got on him and he won Indeed. from then on on him. And Brian, of course, who passed away last year, he won the first two nationals. He won the first two nationals and he beat Crisp the first day, which just collared him the last, and that was, I think that's the track record. I don't think he's been broke since. It was nine minutes or seconds, it's very fast. You know, and then the following year he won again. He beat Les Cargo. That time you would get very good horses running in it, you know. And the f third year, then he ran in it. He, he, he was second, and Les Cargo beat him. But he was given Les Cargo a stone and a half. He had top weight, and Les Cargo had about 10 6 or 10 8 or something. Amazing. So it was amazing. And he was a real. Aintree horse then, I mean, he, he kept used his to best. love the place. He'd prick his ears and he was in, enjoy it, you know, because he, he was never out of the first two while he ran there. As it, I think he was second even over hurdles there, or third or something. He was never out of the first two in Aintree. Yeah. It's something about it. Because when I was riding down at the start, he'd be on his toes like in no other place when sure. he got there, you sure. know. And he was, of course, only trained up the road from it. He must have been quite a an, uh, an curiosity at the time, being trained literally on the edge of Liverpool. Well, Ginger, you was to train about, about 200 yards from the beach and going down every morning to go in front of him is on the main road because he'd kick a car or something going by. So Ginger had to go down and stop the traffic. When you, when you were asked to reunite with him then for uh, the national uh, brian fletcher the year he was second on him and he rode him in a few races the following year and he said the horse was gone and brian ginger said they fell out okay. and he asked me to ride him so i got back on him and i rode him in one or two races i said the horse is all right he's fine so we go to aintree and we finish second to rag trade we run well Sure. And, and we jumped the last in front, and I thought it'd win, but Ragtrade just came up and beat us. And at that stage, did you think that's as good as he's going to be again? Did you ever think that he would come back? Well, I thought that he, he wasn't gone backwards anyway, that he was, he was still at his, as good as he was, you know. Okay. Because at that stage, he'd gone up on the weights. He was top weight then. So he had to carry weight and everything else, you know. Sure, sure. But he was stones better at Liverpool than... At Liverpool, yeah, yeah. He was a different horse. What do you remember about that day at Aintree in 1977, 40 years ago this year? Just beforehand, you know, the, there, were, there was such a big crowd there and the anticipation of him going, running in his fifth national, one, two, second twice, and going out for the third time. You know, it was, and he was joint favourite that year with Mick O'Toole's horse, Davy Ladd, who had won the Gold Cup the previous year, and Red Rum was given Davy Ladd eight or nine pound. So when you think of you're given a Gold Cup horse eight or nine pound, it wasn't easy. And there was plenty other good horses in the race as well. You had a big field that year oh, as well. Oh, it was 42. And we jumped off, but there was six fell at the first. And going to the third, six fell at the third. So 12 were gone at that stage. Going down to beaches, I was 12th to 14th. I couldn't believe it. There was a horse of leadness at that stage. And anyway, coming around, going round down the second time round, there was quite a few fallers here and there, you know. And going down to beach the second time, Andy Pandy took it up, Fred Rymel's horse. And he was about six lengths in front of me. And going to beach the second time, some of the crowd roared. I knew something had happened. He fell. And I see you can't see the other side of beaches coming to it. 
and I just got over and I just missed him. <laughs> right. I just avoided him. Sure. And I was look, and I was in front from there on. And going to the canal turn, there was a loose horse on my inside, and I was frightened he'd take me out at the canal. And I I'd race him to get past him on the canal and I got past him. And I was in, in front from then home. And going to the coming around after the second last, coming off the Mellon Road. I could hear a horse coming behind me to Churchtown by Martin Blackshaw. Right. He was coming up behind me. I jumped the second last. I heard him hit it. I knew he was gone at that stage. So going to the last, I just let him pop the fence. Sure, he won 20 lengths. And I kept him in the middle of the course. I didn't want the thing like Dick Francis and Devon Locke. I didn't want. <laughs> so I kept him in the middle of the course to make sure that <laughs> he was. I never touched him with a stick that day. Was he one of these horses who looked after himself or did you have to, to take care of him as well? He was very careful at his fences. He'd know what to do. Yeah. He was very intelligent horse. He had a great head and everything else. And I'll never forget that night we won. We went back to the hotel in Southport. Right. And they brought the, the horse into the hotel, up the foyer, down into the ballroom. <laughs> the place was mobbed right. and he stood there like for about an hour and everybody clapping him nice. and it's amazing amazing yeah and about a week later they had a big parade up the village of the town of southport with him leading a parade as well how important was that win to you in terms of your career i mean it's the race that gets you noticed more than any other race when you're a jockey the one thing you always want to win is the grand Nat. it's the one race that you dream about winning because trying to be a champion jockey is usually beyond your dreams because you're not able to do it. Mm -hmm. But trying to win the national is the one thing any jockey has a chance to do. So to win that was something else.